This is the lecture for Enox, why I'm an objectivist about ethics and why you are too. Uh, we have Enoch over here on the left. So uh, you don't need to watch this lecture before you do the reading. I'm not going to talk about things you need to know to understand the reading, uh, except I'll note that uh, unlike every single other thing we have read in this class, this was written uh, for you. It was designed to be uh, read by undergraduates rather than like professionals basically so hopefully you find it a bit more straightforward than every other reading in the course uh, so maybe it will be easier uh, so you can keep watching this lecture or read it first either direction works but we're going to talk about two things in this lecture uh, the aspirations of morality to objectivity and uh, moral epistemology so First, the aspirations of morality to objectivity. So on page 10, we've made it through Enoch's argument for the objectivity of morality. And he says, uh, in insisting that morality is objective in this sense, for instance, by relying on the reasons given in the previous section, it's important to see what has and what has not been established. And it turns out that what has been established is that what the discussion of objectively tentatively establishes is just something about the aspirations of moral discourse, namely that it aspires to objectivity. If our moral judgments are to be true, it must be the case that things have value, that people have rights and duty, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, or let's just finish, but establishing that moral discourse aspires to objectivity is one thing. Whether there actually are objective moral truths is quite another. So if you think back to when we talked about moral skepticism, one of the things I said in the introductory lecture for that unit is, uh, it turns out moral skepticism is about moral objectivity. And we're going to see moral objectivity again in the class. And you know, we've made it, we're here, we, we got here again. And if you think back to what we read about in Moral Skepticism, one of the points that Mackey made, one of the points that I talked about in the lecture for Mackey, and one of the points that was sort of in the part of the Mackey reading that we kind of skipped over, is where Mackey established that morality has aspirations to objectivity, or moral discourse has aspirations to objectivity. And so notice this is a way in which Enoch and Mackey agree. Enoch thinks that moral discourse has aspirations to objectivity. Mackey says moral discourse has aspirations to objectivity. So what are aspirations to objectivity? All that means is that when people say moral things, when I say that is morally wrong or you shouldn't do that morally, and not just when we use the word morality, but when we talk about ethics, so when we say that people have various rights or duties or that things have value, or that things are better or worse, or that there are better or worse ways to live our lives. The idea is whenever we make statements like this, sort of the kind of statements we've been examining in this class the whole time, whenever we make statements like this, we're making statements about objective truths rather than subjective truths. So that is something Mackey thinks he's established in the part we didn't really read. This is something Enoch thinks he's established in this paper. So it's interesting that even though Enoch and Mackey disagree about whether morality is objective, they agree that morality aspires to objectivity. The reason Mackey is what we called an error theorist back then is that Mackey thinks morality aspires to objectivity and there is no objectivity, so morality is all basically one big error. Enoch thinks morality aspires to objectivity and great news, there is objectivity, so we're quite all right. So that's an interesting comparison between Enoch and Mackey. What about Brink, the other person we read back in the moral skepticism section? So if you recall, Brink rejected part of the way Mackey was framing things. When Mackey says morality aspires to objectivity, what did he mean? Well, he means it aspires to objectivity, just what we talked about. But then Mackey understands objectivity in a very specific way. Not only is morality objective in the sense Enoch is talking about, but it's also sort of 
objectively motivating or objectively rational. What that means for Mackey is that knowing some moral truth or making some moral judgment is supposed to give you a motivation automatically or give you a reason to do the moral thing automatically. So if you judge that something is morally better, then you must be motivated to it or to do it, or you must have some reason to do it, or maybe both. Brink says, look, Mackey is not very clear about this, but these are sort of two separate theses. He called them motivation internalism and reasons internalism. And he said, look, these are interesting theses, but they're wrong. It's false. Uh, judging something to be morally good doesn't mean you're necessarily motivated to do it, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have a reason to do it. Both kinds of internalism are false. We should be externalists. Something can be morally good, and yet you might have no motivation to do it, and you might have no reason to do it. Of course, you usually will have some motivation or some reason the way Brink ends up explaining things, so you can go back and read Brink to see that. But when we put things that way, Brink is sort of rejecting one part of objectivity. He's saying morality is not objectively motivating or objectively rational in the way Mackey wanted. But Brink was still defending moral objectivity. What kind of objectivity was he defending if it's not motivational or rational? He was defending truth. Moral truths are objectively true or false. So when you say, uh, you know, this is a better way to live your life, morally speaking. Like, morally, it would be better if you did this. That's objectively true or objectively false. That's not a subjective judgment. That's an objective judgment. So that's how Brink is thinking about objectivity. It's in terms of moral truths. That's not how Mackey was thinking about objectivity. Mackey had a stronger thing. He had the motivation and or the reasons objectivity. What about Enoch? Uh, I don't know, except that in the paper, Enoch is talking entirely about moral truths, it seems like, or almost entirely about moral truths. So the impression I get is that Enoch just has Brink's idea in mind, which is moral objectivity is about the truth of moral statements. Are they objectively true or objectively false? Is Enoch worried about whether they're objectively motivating or objectively rational? Not so much in this paper, it seems like. So if you agree with Mackey that motivation internalism or reasons internalism or both are correct, then you disagreed back with Brink, and maybe you would disagree with Enoch, but maybe not. Maybe Enoch could accept motivation internalism and or reasons internalism. So that's up to you to sort of think about. It's an interesting topic, uh, perhaps. I, I, I think it's interesting. So that was the first thing. Does morality aspire to objectivity? And then we had a discussion of internalism coming back up. Second topic, Enoch versus Brink on moral epistemology. So Enoch and Brink potentially can agree on objectivity in the sense of motivation and stuff. But it turns out they disagree, or they almost certainly disagree, on moral epistemology. So if you recall, one of Mackey's challenges to the objectivity of morality is that if morality were objective, it would be so strange that it's not clear how we would ever learn about it. We would have to have some special moral intuition to pick up on these magical moral facts. Like, where, how would we know any of this? How would we learn about any of this? What was Brink's solution? Well, Brink's solution was the moral facts supervene on the natural facts. Very briefly in the paper, he actually said either they supervene on or maybe they just are natural facts, but he said supervenience makes more sense. So the moral facts supervene on the natural facts. And so how do we learn about moral facts? Well, we come up with a moral theory to sort of figure out which moral facts supervene on which natural facts, and then we study the natural facts. And in doing so, we can learn about the moral facts. So the suggestion Brink made was maybe the moral facts are facts about what tends to sustain uh, human life and what tends to cause human life to flourish. And so there are natural facts about what will cause human life to flourish, and these would be the moral facts. And we don't need some special magical epistemological moral intuition. 
we can just do science to figure out what's going to make humans flourish. That's pretty straightforward. So that was Brink's answer. How does Enoch respond to the epistemology challenge from Mackey and others? So Enoch's response to the epistemology challenge is different. He says, first of all, look, other things than just morality face this challenge. So for instance, mathematics and, by the way, philosophy face this challenge. How do we come to get mathematical knowledge or how do we come to get philosophical knowledge? It's not through empirical investigation into the world. You don't do science to prove some math proof. The mathematicians, when you ask them how they prove things, it's not like they got out their instruments and they measured stuff. They just sat there thinking about it for a while. So if that's okay with math, why isn't it okay with morality? What's the big deal? Morality is weird like math is weird, but math surely is objective. <laughs> like Nobody argues that two plus two is four and that's just your opinion or something like that. So Enoch seems happier than Brink to admit the possibility that, look, there is some sort of special moral sense, but only special in the sense that there's like a special mathematical sense and a special philosophical sense, which is, look, there are things that are non-natural that we know about. Would Mackey be okay with this? So Mackey's argument was, uh, look, there's other weird stuff like math, but we can either come up with natural explanations of how we know those, or we should say those things don't exist, just like morality doesn't exist. Does Mackey want to say math doesn't exist, or does Mackey want to say math is natural? I don't know. He never sort of explained that. He just said, those are the two options. Enoch thinks we don't go for either of those two options. Math exists, but it's not natural, and so let's say the same thing about morality. Perhaps then, he says, what is really needed is a general epistemology of the a priori. Things uh, of those areas, roughly, where the empirical method seems out of place. And perhaps it's not overly optimistic to think that any plausible epistemology of the a priori will vindicate moral knowledge as well. So the thought is, look, we have to explain math somehow. Math seems non-empirical. And so we can explain morality the same way. So that's a different route than Brink went. Brink tried to give us an empirical method for finding morality, and Enoch is trying to give us a non-empirical, an a priori method. Brink may have reminded you a bit of Aristotle. Aristotle thought morality was about what causes human beings to flourish. Brink thinks maybe morality is about what causes human beings to flourish. Aristotle had a very naturalistic approach. Brink had a naturalistic approach. Enoch might remind you of Kant. Kant thinks morality can be proven entirely a priori. Enoch thinks morality can be proven either entirely or partially a priori. So that's interesting. And then Enoch has more to say, but you'll see that when you read uh, the article. So those are two interesting sort of comparisons since we've seen this topic once already in the class, I thought I'd bring it up again and compare and contrast what we have here with what we had before.